The envelopes, please, Mr. Holford. May we hear the sound of the envelope tearing, please? Uh, you open it, Doris. All right. The winner is? And the winner is. And the Oscar goes to? The Oscar goes to? And the Oscar goes to? day teeth would go in, contact lenses, and the wigs would finally be fitted. Tons and tons of hair in the upper lip. The nostrils, it's more than just the ears. The eyebrows are just as important. The little differences you have to do, the coloring matching and the age spots matching every day, it's insane. You have to do the entire face and then come back and do it again. Uh, this is all just temporary. Faces, bodies, and hands are transformed through the use of molds, prosthetics, wigs, appliances, and most of all, a creative eye and a vivid imagination. In motion pictures, a very highly specialized medium, we who toil as performers are happily surrounded with a whole core of wonderful makeup on. And they are really often the unsung heroes. An art that goes back to the ancient Egyptians and which our makeup artists continue to improve. The winner is an American Werewolf in London. Quest for five. Amadeus. For the fly, Harry and the Hendersons. Makeup goes to from Mrs. Doubtfire. Well, hello and welcome to the Oscar Week Makeup Artist and Hairstylist Symposium. Yay, we're here. <laughs> My name is Lois Burwell and I'm chairman and one of the three makeup and hairstyling branch governors hosting this program. You'll be hearing from Vice Chair Leonard Engelman and hairstylist governor Kathy Blondell shortly. The Academy gives the, the Oscar to honor and celebrate the art of motion pictures. We are here today to celebrate some exceptional work in the art of makeup and hairstyling in a motion picture. Each one of our nominees are winners already. Only one will take home the Oscar, but each one has proven their work to be exceptional by the fact that they are here today. In today's program, we will introduce each film, what work is being considered for that film, then we will invite the artists for that film to, to the stage to discuss and show some photographs 
to explore in greater detail methods, materials, and how it all came together to create their wonderful work. We will then screen the 10-minute reel shown at the Bake Off. I know that's a mystifying expression, but it will be explained shortly. It has nothing to do with fairy cakes. Once we have seen and spoken with all three film artists, we will then invite all the nominees to the stage for a Q&A from you, the audience. Our three films nominees this year are, for The Darkest Hour, Karuhira Suji, David Malinowski, and Lucy Sibick. For Victoria and Abdul, Daniel Phillips and Lou Shepard. For Wonder, Arian Dighton. Would, before we begin, please, would all the nominees stand and face the audience so we can actually give you thanks for the work you've done on the silver screen. Over to you, Leonard. Today is a celebration of winners. Every nominee that steps on this stage today is a winner. And every nominee tomorrow and in the past is a winner. The Oscar tells us that the world, um, that filmmaking is an art. And it's being practiced by some people at a very high level. Some of those people are in the room today. They are past Oscar recipients and nominees. When I call your name, please stand and remain standing until the end. Christina Smith. Martin Samuel. Robert Pandini. Robert Short. Richard Alonzo. Bill Corso. Michelle Burke. Kevin Haney. Ed French, Barbara Lorenz, Deborah Lamia Denever, Dan Strepek, Lois Burwell, Kazuhiro Sushi, Mike Elizaldi, and Trevor Proward. Fabulous work. We would also like to recognize from the Makeup Artists and Hairstylists Guild Local 706, Tommy Cole, business representative, Sue Cabrell Ebert. <laughs> Sue Cabrell Ebert is the president and assistant to the business representative. And Randy Sayer, who's the assistant to the business representative. <laughs> and at this time, we would also like to thank the Academy's Randy Haberkamp, Rose Witt, Wilson, and the team for all the work and coordination in making this function take place. <laughs> I've told this story before, but I feel that it's very important. In 1968, prior to there being a yearly Oscar for makeup, Planet of the Apes was going to receive a special Academy Award. That award, as was the process of the times, would have gone to the makeup department head at 20th Century Fox, Dan Strepek. Dan said, the person most responsible for this achievement is John Chambers, and he must receive the Oscar. It is that standard of honesty and responsibility that we follow today as the committee painstakingly chooses the individuals most responsible for what has been recognized in each film. Today, we have Dan Strepek in the audience. Dan, please stand. <laughs> the selection of the films is complex. It may be for the film in its entirety, for makeup and hairstyling, or for makeup only, or for hairstyling only or for a specific character or characters for makeup or makeup and hairstyling. From this, we recognize the artists or artists most responsible for those achievements. Now, please welcome Catherine Blondell. Uh, 
Our branch is well aware of how our nominees, nominations are run, but please allow me to inform our guests and those who might not know our procedure. In April and October, the Makeup Artist and Hairstylist Executive Committee meet. As part of the business, they discuss the, the list of films that have been released during the year, during the previous months. Out of these films come recommendations of films to be seen for makeup and, and or hairstyling. The list of films that have been discussed is posted on our Academy website throughout the year. We would like everyone to have the opportunity to see these films as they come out on the big screen. So there are not so many to be seen, possibly only on DVD at the end of the year. We also encourage anyone from our branch that has seen a movie they feel should be seen to post that film on our Academy discussion board so we are able to go see that film. In November, all branch members are asked to attend a branch meeting to discuss the films. And then in December, an all branch meeting is called to vote for the seven films that will go on for consideration. This year, those seven films were chosen, the seven children, sorry, the seven films that were chosen were Bright, The Darkest Hour, Ghost in the Shell, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2, I, Tonya, Victorian Abdul, Wonder. Following the, that December meeting, the makeup, art, makeup and Hairstylist Executive Committee meets, and this meeting is to choose a maximum of two names, possibly three, for those most responsible for the look of each film or character or characters. This decision is based on input and the work that was done. Then in January, all members were asked to attend a presentation by the makeup artists and hairstylists recognized for the seven films. This is referred to as the Bake Off, which was, li which was live streamed so our members who were e either on location or in other countries could participate and vote then they vote online. Academy makeup artists and hairstylist members spend a tremendous amount of unselfish time in an effort to applaud the work of others. We also have to thank our staff members at the Academy, Tom Oyer and Michelle Ayola, for th that spend numerous hours above and beyond the working week to help us get all of our work done. Now let's meet our nominees. The first film we're going to see and discuss is uh, The Darkest Hour. Uh, please welcome to the stage Kazuhiro Sushi. <laughs> Kazu is credited as the prosthetic makeup uh, and hair designer for Gary Oldman. This is the third Oscar nomination for Kazu. He was nominated for Click and for Norbit. Two weeks ago, Kazu received a BAFTA award, and one week ago, a Makeup Artist, Artist and Hairstylist Guild Award for Darkest Hour. Presently, Kazu is designing projects. Please welcome David Malinowski to the stage. David is credited as the personal makeup artist for Gary Oldman and prosthetic makeup supervisor for Gary Oldman. Two weeks ago, David received a BAFTA award and one week ago, a Makeup Artist and Hairstylist Guild Award <laughs> for The Darkest Hour. <laughs> David recently completed Bohemian Rhapsody. And welcome Lucy Civic. Lucy is credited as the prosthetic makeup and hair artist for Gary Ullman. Now, two weeks ago, Lucy received a BAFTA award and one week ago, a Makeup Artist and Hairstylist Guild Award for Darkest Hour. <laughs> and Lucy is presently working on uh, Game of Thrones.
Well, that almost got the biggest applause of all. <laughs> um, let's take a look at our first photo here. And you can also see the, see the photos on the, uh, the screen up here. Um, to me, this is so amazing because you don't see Gary in the makeup. Uh, and one of the things that I thought was so fantastic, uh, Darkest Hour won a lot of awards, Gary won a lot of awards, and every time he won an award, he would thank his team. He thanked his team and he named every one of them. Now, as you know, that doesn't happen very often, okay? But it was wonderful that he considered his team. And to me, knowing sort of what took place, I think there were four people in the team. I think the three here, and I think Gary was also part of that team. Tell us, Kazu, or David actually, tell us a little bit about what was happening during the process of filming, because I think it's unusual um, that he was so participating. Yeah, um, you know, G Gary's amazing, uh, amazing actor, amazing friend, and he's just amazing in the chair. Uh, he would, he would come in at ridiculous times of the morning. Uh, I don't know the earliest time he was in, probably three or four in the morning, wasn't it, to apply his makeup and would shave his head every day, which was really frustrating, just the sound of the razor buzzing in his ear. Um, but he would just sit there if we wanted him to close his eyes, open his eyes, sit still, move his head. He would just do exactly what we said when we wanted it because he realised that that's our time to work. You know, that's... He respects our craft, we do our job, and if he does what we want, he gets the best result, you know, the best makeup result is achieved. And then when he goes to set, he does a similar thing, you know, he wants the respect back, he wants people to be quiet when he's acting, he doesn't want you to be messing around in the background. So, yeah, he's amazing. We've been really spoiled with Gary. Um, he, yeah, definitely the best actor I've worked on so far. I think that's worth a round of applause. And Lucy also, while um, everybody was on the set, um, I believe that he was very respectful and took care of the makeup, is that correct? Yes, he was really good. Um, we didn't have a huge amount of time for checks, so he was really patient and would always let me, you know, touch up the wig or do any little highlighting or shading or anything that we needed to do. So then when, I, when it was checks, we, you know, could focus on the important things. The, as we look at these two images, um, it's almost hard to believe that the image on the right uh, is, um, is Gary Oldman. You just don't see Gary Oldman, especially if you've seen the film. Um, in the film from moment one, you don't see Gary Oldman. Let's take a look at the next uh, slide. Now here we see um, one of the one of the uh, prosthetics that's being applied and also the mold uh, that this came from. Uh, and Kazu, um, I believe this must have been one of the test makeups uh, because I see that there's a, a ball cap and I know that he shaved his head later. But um, just tell us a little bit, what, how many appliances were involved in this and how did this come about? Yes, uh, so we did uh, three different tests at first and uh, kind of varies from light, medium, heavy. And we were trying different look and to figure out what would be the best way to go because it's Gary doesn't look like Charger at all. So we had to figure out what would be the best balance to do as a makeup. And what we settled on was, uh, so he has a nose tip and a chin and a pair of cheeks and a big neck piece. And uh, I also put the vacuum foam behind his ear to alter his ear shape. And he also had the uh, body suits, and we had a wig on. Yeah, so we had some pieces on his forehead, uh, like because the charger has a big scar on the middle of the forehead. But uh, we thought it's not that important for the movie, the content of the movie, because there's no explanation how he got the scar on the forehead, and because it will create more problem on set rather than mm -hmm. explain something. So. That's how we, we came. Sounded like a wise choice. How many knew that Churchill had a scar on his forehead? <laughs> Two, three. Okay. 
Okay, I hope you're telling the truth. Uh, <laughs> okay, so it was a, certainly a, a wise decision yes, to, uh, yes, yeah. to make that well, change. Um, so did you started off in, with quite a number of appliances, then by the time you got done to actually mm -hmm. uh, the filming, mm -hmm. uh, then were there fewer appliances other than the forehead? Uh, yes, uh, because... Um yeah, we had, I think it's, a, we had some other, like, uh, eyelids and other pieces, but, yeah, we, we sat on, on that, those pieces, and the, that, the sculpture on uh, right is, uh, like, a last piece I sculpted, actually, in Spain, and a kind of last-minute change, because I thought I could improve the look <coughs> more, even more, to look like a Churchill. And I w sculpted it over w over the weekend and just molded it and <laughs> brought back, and th th that worked out re great. So, yeah. there is nothing like perfection. <laughs> this was um, certainly a, a great undertaking, um, and you know we can see part of that. Th let's take a look at the next clip here now, or the next photo. Okay, now here we see the wig. Uh, and um, Gary in the process. Uh, and I have to say that I thought the wig and the whole look of the wig was just so amazing. And Kanso, I believe that you made the wig. Yeah. Can you tell us a little about the wig and the hair and the lace? Yeah, and uh, here's Diana Choi, and she's uh, my wig maker, and she made a wig. <laughs> Uh, so we used uh, English lace for the front, and we mixed uh, baby uh, European hair with Angola hair. And we tried to make it as fine as possible because we tend to look too heavy. I didn't want that look, so I wanted to make it natural and they also the skin underneath shows through. So uh, we did that, and um, it was quite tricky wig to apply too because if, if there's any kind of imperfection, uh, it will show through. And, but uh, Lucy maintained the all five wigs on set and she did an amazing job, I think. Yeah. So you had five wigs, um, and I believe because they were somewhat fragile, Yes, and that's why you need so many? This only lasts for like a, probably like a 10 days of the shooting, so we have to replace the, to the new wigs. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, you know, I, a few months ago when we had the, um, some of the photos that you're going to see downstairs, um, our executive committee was looking at these photos and just amazed because we saw no edges and appliances. We not saw no anything. We just saw skin. We were looking at the at the wigs, uh, and the, you know the application, and several of us said, "Well, you know, it's not a wig." <laughs> now they they punched the hair. They, they very definitely they punched the hair, um, and we were all wrong. It was a wig, and it was just beautifully applied and beautifully dressed. So many times a wig ends up to be just sort of straight hair. But in this case, it had swirls, it had movement, you know, it, it became real. Uh, and Lucy, <coughs> so many times a wig in the back just sort of sticks out straight. But you had a way of taking care of it that I thought was so unique, I'd never heard of it before. Can you explain what you did there? Um, well, the, f the first few days we went to set, um, we were finding that the back of the wig would kick up from where the appliance was and where the collar was. So myself and David thought, oh, we're going to have to find a way to nail this down because otherwise we're going to be in hell for the whole film. So we decided we'd sew it to the appliance. So that's what we did. We just did like a thread all the way through and that kind of solved the problem. Mm -hmm. And I think Gary was pleased about that actually because for the first few days we did go in and pester him a bit. Okay, let's take a look at the, uh, um, at the other uh, uh, next uh, photos here. Okay, here you see... Uh, pretty well completed, probably uh, touching up on the set, uh, and some wonderful work. And David, in uh, David and Lucy, in applying the pieces, how did you go about that? When, what was the first piece, and then the next piece? 
Um, so we would put the neck on first over the head. Um, or we had a foam piece that went underneath the neck to bridge the gap between the bodysuit and the appliance. Um, and then we did a cheek first, so I'd anchor my side, David would help there, and then he'd go back to his cheek. And then we'd, I'd paint the head, and then we'd go on with the nose tip and then the chin. We'd try and save that till last, because that was the, probably one of the most tricky ones to do, I think. Well, it worked out great. Um, now, you obviously had a very large team, because you had to prepare, you, the appliances were made elsewhere. Uh, you had to prepare them, pre-color them, apply and maintain during the day. Uh, you had to prepare for the next day. You had to remove the makeup, which I believe was about an hour. And then you had to try to get some sleep. <laughs> now, how many people were on your team? Just us two sitting here. <laughs> Is that great? Yeah, we did the whole thing, yeah. Okay, let's take a look at our next uh, slide here. Or, and here you see Winston Churchill standing with the bodysuit on, you know, the whole character and everything. And I know the story from the very beginning when they first talked to Gary about uh, taking on this character. And um, if I'm correct, he said, well, the only way I'll do it is if Kasu does it. Correct? Fantastic. Okay. All right. Uh, we're going to take a look now at our film clip, and congratulations, and uh, all the best tomorrow. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. There's a telegram. And by landing Shh. from parachutes. The armies of the low countries are resisting. An appeal for help has been made to the Allied governments. And it's from the palace. That Allied troops are moving to their support. A hundred war planes were seen over Brussels, and it's now reported that in the first raid over Brussels, several hundred people were killed and wounded and several buildings destroyed. Five minutes ago, the Amnesty announced that in the hours of this morning, Thank you. Miss Layton. Hardly seems like there's a war on at all. You know, I've never ridden a bus. Sir? I've never queued for bread. I believe I can boil an egg, but only because I've seen it done. <laughs> well, that was quite easy. Yes, it was. <clears throat> I believe we are to meet regularly. Once a week, I'm afraid. How is... How are you for Mondays? Uh, I shall endeavour to be available on Mondays. Four o'clock? I nap at four. Is that permissible? No, but necessary. I give you your father, my beloved husband, the Prime Minister. <laughs> the Prime, Prime Minister! Minister. Here's to, um, to not buggering it up. <laughs> not, not buggering it up. up. Air cover for our troops. The Luftwaffe control the skies. We simply don't have enough planes to challenge them. In fact, I strongly recommend we stop sending our precious fighter planes to be wasted in France. Save them for our own defense. And our Navy sits idle, neutralized, useless. Collectively, we are looking at the collapse of Western Europe in the next few days. Should the public be told?
Not yet. First, we must rouse our old friends to an heroic resistance. Winston, we are facing certain defeat on land, the annihilation of our army, and imminent invasion. We must be rational. We are a seagoing nation. We have been since the Bronze Age. The Channel is ours. It's our moat, our battlement, and the German doesn't recognize an expanse of water greater than a bloody lake. They have first to reach this island, Edward. Where men, women and children whom we will have failed despicably in our duty of protection will be entirely defenseless... And whose fault is that? ...against the largest army the world has ever seen. Furthermore, once France falls, Germany can concentrate on aircraft production. They will then have the French fleet as well. What is to stop Herr Hitler then? Winston, words, words, words alone. I need not impress upon you the trouble faced by the Western Hemisphere. Uh, without your support in some fashion... I know, I know. You are on my mind day and night. Look, we could possibly... Uh, Mr. President... Uh, I mean to say... We are facing uh, the gravest odds. We could take your planes to about a mile from the Canadian border. Mm -hmm. And then, if you send across a team of horses from Canada, nothing motorized, then you could pull them over the border yourself. How does that sound? Horses? Um... You, you did say uh, a, a, a team of horses. I should like to discuss. <clears throat> I have been asked if plans should be drawn to evacuate myself and my family to Canada. I would like to know the opinion of our Prime Minister. Well, my opinion would be that you must do what you feel is right for yourself, or your family, and the nation. But your survival is paramount. Prime Ministers, well, we seem to come and go at an astonishing rate. Hitler will not insist on outrageous terms. He will know his own weaknesses. He will be reasonable. When will the lesson be learned? When will the lesson be learned? How many more dictators must be uh, wooed, appeased, good God, given him mixed privileges, before we learn? You cannot reason with a tiger when your head is in its mouth! Belgium has fallen. They will surrender at midnight. France will soon follow suit. Do you know how to use this thing? Yes, sir. How do I get to Westminster? Westminster, um... The District Line East, one stop. District Line East, one stop. Well, that doesn't sound so hard. No, sir. Thank you. 
Thank you, sir. We shall not flag or fail. We shall go on to the end! We shall fight in France. We shall fight on the seas and oceans. We shall fight with, with growing confidence and growing strength in the air. We shall defend our island, whatever the cost may be. We shall fight on the beaches. We shall fight on the landing grounds. We shall fight in the fields and in the streets. We shall fight in the hills. We shall never surrender! And if, which I, I, I do not for a moment believe, this island or large part of it were were, were subjugated and starving, then our empire be on the seas, armed and guarded by the British fleet, yeah. would carry on the struggle yeah. until in God's good time, the new world, with all its power and might, steps forth to the rescue and the liberation of the old. Victoria and Abdul. Ab Abdul Karim arrives from Indian to participate in Queen Victoria's Golden Jubilee. The young clerk is surprised to find favor with the queen herself as Victoria questions the constrictions of her long-held position. The two forge an unlikely and devoted alliance that her household and inner circle try to destroy. As the friendship deepens, the queen begins to see changing world through new eyes, joyfully reclaiming her humanity. Daniel Phillips, makeup and hair designer. Daniel has been nominated and won many awards, including a BAFTA. Lou Shepard, co-hair designer. Lou has also been nominated several times for her, well, her work. Please welcome Daniel Phillips and Lou Shepard. Congratulations. Thank you. Hello. Well, first of all, I'd like to ask you how the two of you became involved in this project and uh, what were the objectives in uh, designing the look for this royal family? Um, I've worked with Stephen Frears for many years. I think the first film I ever did with him was The Queen. 10 years ago or so. Um, and I've known Lou for some time. Lou, when I used to be at the BBC, Lou came to teach us period hairdressing. Um, so that's how Lou and I know each other. And then um, having worked with Stephen, he then invited me to work on this production. Um, and it, he, he made clear to me that it wasn't a film about lookalikes. The audience knew Judy as Victoria in a previous film. It was really a film about relationships and um, that my brief was to portray um, the pain in her life at the time before um, Abdul came onto the scene and really just show that progression in her life from the, from the apathy and the pain to the joy of meeting a new friend that she could trust. Um, so that's how, that was my brief really. It wasn't about making a lookalike, it was about more about showing a relationship blossoming, I guess. Great. Uh, are you uh, t both still hands-on uh, with the makeup and hair? 
And is that important to you? Yeah, it is. We, we're both hands-on. I know sometimes people run in a department uh, just to oversee it, but we don't believe in doing that. We, we're really hands-on all the time. Mm. I, we, we do all of the fittings. Um, I generally make up the lead actors. <laughs> I think probably most of us as makeup artists were all slightly control freaks, and I think, I know I would, I would certainly try and make everybody up if I possibly could, mm. but uh, you do have to let go somewhere. Um, but it's important that I retain my skills, and, and I find more and more what's happening, the more the jobs I take on, the bigger jobs particularly, um, I tend to be spending more time pushing paper and doing budgets and things. So. I always try to make up at least one person just to keep my hand in because one has to remember that's why I'm doing the job I do. And it's so easy to get bogged down. And also, you know, I love teaching. I like having new students. So um, it's quite important that I keep my skills up as well. Mm -hmm. I think for you as well. Great. Right. Oh, it is. It is. We have little workshops because um, obviously we've got lots of great hair and makeup artists, but they, might, they obviously didn't all do this period. Some of them never done it before. So we had little workshops and went through things, and uh, it's just a process. And uh, then we got to where we did. So um, we had lots of prep on the job. We had to, we we had lots of wigs that had to be dressed, um, separate pieces. Um, so it was really quite quite a job, and we had quite a big team doing it. So right. they were great. All of when them. you say lots of prep, probably a couple of weeks. No, not so, lots of prep. <laughs> I mean, what I mean is not we didn't have lots of yeah. prep. We had, you didn't have lots of mean, time. Well, I didn't but as we were working, we yeah. had to do in between lots of prep. I don't That's think many people say. have lots of prep now. No, so, I, I mean, don't. I'm lucky if I see an actor once. Um, I think I saw Judy, I, because I've worked with Judy before, so I know her. But we're lucky if we see an actor once for a fitting. I think I had a and week's prep, didn't I? You probably had a week's prep. Yeah. And, then you, um, <laughs> and then you do your test. You're lucky if you get an actor for a makeup test for a start. And then um, you tend to just do them on the day, which is how, you know, it wasn't a huge budget. Um, and you just get everybody ready on the day and you hope that you have everything available to, for any unforeseen problems, basically. Mm -hmm. But that uh, is half the fun of it, I have to say. Sorry, Cathy. No. I mean, we kind of work out of our kits quite a lot. Yeah. We're very much on set makeup people. And in between things, in between setups and whatever, we're obviously prepping, doing bits and pieces, to trying to catch up. I believe uh, you brought a guest with you today. Yes. Mm. All the way from California, Ali yes. Fazal is here, I believe. Somewhere. Hello. Can we that one? <laughs> Hello. Just say nice things. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> well, you'll see that their first photo that we have is Ali's uh, character, is Abdul. Uh, and would you explain his look and the process that you did to uh, age him? Um, this is really only an aging of about 10 years, I think it was, in the story. And it was something we did in a little bus in Agra, in India. <laughs> we didn't really get a test makeup on this. And I think I remember people knocking on the door for saying, we'd only had like 30 minutes saying, are you done yet? Are you done yet? And we hadn't really had many a, a practice at all. I think we had one practice in London. And we were having to, because we were shooting out a sequence all of the time, we were just having to lay in hair. That was just um, stipple latex, if I remember. And some lenses, you had some aging lenses. Well, yeah, we had the lenses. Well, we were freaking out about the lenses. For well, because the lenses, <laughs> were, I had the lenses made. And they were just, they were very... Very fine, beautiful lenses with just a ring around, which just aged the eyes very slightly. And um, we opened the box on the day and all the colour had faded. Actually, it was the day before, the colour had completely before, sure, faded. Yeah. So um, we managed to get them fed FedEx out again. But that was a bit upsetting for you. But there was, there was a lot of improvising. Yeah, you, you, it you is a it. lot of improvising. Yeah. I mean, and also <laughs> laying in beards, especially laying in a beard and you're trying to do it in a certain amount of time. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a tricky business when it's up there on the big screen, basically. Absolutely. Um, but I think we kind of got away with it. <laughs> <laughs> so, Ali, uh, can you tell us a little about your experience with uh, these two artists? Well, <laughs> we'd be caged every morning in a truck 
and that's it. There would be we we'd make some magic. I mean, that's what was happening for me. It was it was a wonderful experience because all of us would come together, and I'd see every chair would be you know there's Judy being made up here, and there's you know Tim uh, Pickett Smith, there's um, you know Eddie awesome. Izzard, everyone, and it was it was phenomenal because every look was different. I mean, especially Eddie's look. You know, you you could make out it's Eddie. Um, and he's playing birdie, and he's just totally transformed. Um, and this was, of course, a lot of improvising that happened in Agra because um, I remember, you know, we were just trying to figure out where, how many years is going to be um, ahead. We wanted to. It's a character that existed in the 1800s, and you had to fuse him with modern times as well. I mean, it's not that it's based in modern times, but. There had to be that connect. There's no videos, no photographs. There's hardly anything. So this whole look was, I mean, there were endless meetings. I remember, you know, and it was one of those yeah. those times where you never get to do a makeup test, and at the back of your mind, the date is drawing nearer and nearer, and, nearer mm -hmm. and you're thinking, I don't know how we're going to get away with this. And it is literally, I mean, Stephen, bless him, is lovely, but he's not. Doesn't leave a lot of time for you, really. To be very tactful there. Um, so. Everything's a rush job, as it often is in, 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 in the films, really. You, yeah. know, you never get the time that you want. But then often that's what, that's how you do your best work, in a way. You just improvise quickly. And that's yeah. the fun of it for us, I think, mm. isn't it? Okay. Uh, and also, I look quite good close up, I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah. you do. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You absolutely mm. do. Yeah, where did you find that? Yeah. yeah. Uh, the arrival to London on the ship was quite amazing, and I'm sure that was quite a lot of work. Uh, Ali, when, uh, from an actor's point of view, after makeup and hair, and they've created this whole image for you to get off of the boat, how does that, does that help you? Oh yeah, I mean, of course. It, yeah, it, it transforms you, it takes you, takes you back there. And it's such a beautiful culmination of costumes and makeup and of course the setting itself. Um, There's also a yeah. lot you don't actually see there, isn't it? I mean, the well, crowd scenes, Lou does a lot of our crowd scene and organizes all of those yeah. scenes. And there's a lot you don't, uh, that goes on behind scenes that you don't actually see, which is often the case. Yeah. But um, it was quite a busy day that day, if I remember. <laughs> yeah, you had a lot of, lot of mm. makeup to be done there mm -hmm. on the, the crowds, yeah. Well, that was a very busy scene. I mean, and it was photographed from far away, so you did see a lot of the work. Mm. It was yeah. good. The local crew were really good. <coughs> How great. Yeah. 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 Okay, the banquet hall. The banquet, oh, yes. I love this banquet We had about 50. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's beautiful makeup and hair from royalty to the help. And Lou, how, was, how large was your team for this? There was this? about 50 of us on it, yeah. Wow. But there were, I can't remember, was it 500? No. Was it, was I th no, I, oh, I can't recall how many essays yeah. we had, extras we had, yeah. but you but had a team, about, about yeah. 50. We had a big team. Yeah. Yeah. Hard to find, really. Yeah, we had to find really good people, obviously. We do also have to have little teachings as well. Yeah, we do. We had to still do that because, <laughs> as I said, however good they are, the majority have never done this before. Mm. So we had to do all that. Yeah. This was, this was my first day. I remember on yeah, saying your first day. That wasn't it. That was a great. That was scene. we were hit yeah. the ground running on this. Yeah. <laughs> I just and, remember. And they were done so quickly like that. I think they? we hit the ground running. We were in Scotland, oh, which yeah. was the, yeah, oh, yeah that was yeah. a rough day. That was a rough day. And then but straight back into this. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. I was itchy. I just remember that. I was just <laughs> with the, standing in the clothes because I couldn't sit. And the consulata wouldn't let me sit because you'd get the crease on, the <laughs> and I had these heavy costumes. So that was, yeah, the makeup was fine. <laughs> no. Okay, the queen. Like. Let's talk about the queen. The queen. Judy Dench mm. and all um, is here. She's seen in all of her looks. The look on the, f sorry, Kathy, the look on the far right, camera right, I think that is, um, that was the makeup test we did actually which we did at glassed shields i think it is that beautiful house they were doing we were doing a test then so it's really seeing how severe we could make her look um that was really the only day we, we had a small test in london 
were well, one test for an hour and then they all wanted to go off for lunch. And you know what test days are like, everything, we over glamorized everything and then we had to start pulling it all back, if I recall, um, because there had to be a transition of Judy's look, you know, from, yes. from um, quite severe to suddenly blossoming. And I think if I recall, that's the first makeup test. Yes. Mm -hmm. Um, that's Blossom, I call that Blossom look, really. Um, that's when she softens, I think. That's when your friendship develops, isn't it, Ali? Yeah. And these, these, are, these makeups are really, you know, there's nothing, I'm not going to sit here and say all the fantastic products used. They're basically cryo and grease paint makeups. Um, and a little bit of Skin Illustrator here and there, but it's all done quite quickly in a way, as was most of the film. You know, I remember the, the wheelchair shot there. I'm yeah. in a corridor being told to get out of the way by Stephen Frears. Move, 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 and it's done in about five minutes, really. Um, that tends to be how a lot of it is done, isn't it, yeah. really? But you know what I, what I loved about this entire process was that it was the makeup and the costumes that tell the time. Um, mm. The frame of this entire movie, because we don't, we never had supers, and this this spans over fourteen years, mm -hmm. thirteen to fourteen years. This entire relationship that these guys had, so those were the little subtleties that were really important to me, uh, because I would always go to Daniel, you know, or on both of them, in fact, to just keep a track of the timelines, instead of my script, because there was nothing there. Lee Hall had written a script that was in a bubble, sort of a love story, I mean, like a fantasy thing going there. So it's the costumes and the makeup that would just take us through all the major events in their lives. I thought that was... Yeah. Uh, and then we had several period women also. Beautiful hair. Lou. Mm. Lou, th there's yes, Lou I mean, there, dressing. Yeah. Oh. Oh, oh. oh, oh you're sorry. Up. <laughs> um, yeah, some of them had wigs and... Uh, <laughs> what, what was I wrong? <laughs> Hold it up. Hold the mic up. Okay. Yes. Um, there was uh, pieces there and wigs, obviously. They all had to have tests. Yeah. We had to dress them all. And um, you saw some of them today. Yes. And you did. And, um, yeah, it's just everyday thing for us, really. Mm. All done very quickly. Uh, not much time. All done, all the fringes were set on little, little dowlings. We try and incorporate could, yeah. some of their own hair where yes. we can. I yeah. think there was Phipps on the yeah. far right. That's partly her own hair. But, yeah. but we do we do all the colouring and the cutting and, yeah. and make the pieces wherever we can. We make yeah, they were made. pieces. Yeah. And also, you know, day-to-day -day things like plastic partings all the time. But there is a skill in, which I find, I get a, when we get a lot of students, so I, I try to take on new students on each job I'm doing, new people. But... Um, they kind of underestimate the importance of wig work, you know, which is why it's so good for us to be here on this stage and in, and in this competition, competition in this consideration, because um, it's a kind of dying art, I feel, this whole period hairstyling thing. It really is a dying art. And there's a lot of students that I get that are not spending the time to learn this skill. And I learned from Lou and I learned from, from college, and I was a hairstylist to start with. But um, people un underestimate how important good hairstyling, good wig dressing is, really. I mean, it can kill a makeup. You could do the most beautiful makeup, but if you've got a bad wig, it, you'll, you'll notice it straight away. But if someone's a good hairstylist, they can make a bad wig look good, can't they? Mm. So that's why everybody should learn their basic skills, and they don't seem to want to do it nowadays. You know, they just think, right, we're going to wing it and just go straight and do the difficult stuff, but you can't. So that's where all the basic skills come into this job, because we use them all. And we try to sort of, uh, as much as possible, do it in the way they did it. So, um, Great. They hurry up, are they? And, uh -huh. and now let's look at the men. It was a beard fest. Oh, you God, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's me again in another jaunty cap, I think that's right. Yeah. Um, lots of beards, yeah. Um, of course, the problem one has now with the cameras, def high definition, is, is the lace a lot of the time. Um, so we did a lot of beard laying on, hair laying on. You, you're lucky you had your own beard apart from at the end, obviously. Mm. Um, but even at the beginning, 
There's something about men in beards that creates a lot of discussion in most movies. That producers don't like to see their actors in beards, if I recall. On most movies I've worked on, there's always some kind of issue with facial hair. But you can't get away with it on this period production. But we did a lot of um, laying on there, which is back to the old, you know, Marcel tongs and, and, and heaters and laying on of hair, basically. Um, and it's surprising how quickly you can do this. You know, you can lay... The, the trouble with lace pre-laid mace pieces is they, they don't really hold under scrutiny. They don't hold for a long time. They don't last. And I find by laying on full beards or partial beards, they'll last the day, really. They don't budge. It's wonderful work. It's really beautiful. Thank you. Um, and then you went on locations. Mm. And you had to shoot outside. Oh, my God. Go. And I think everyone that's a makeup and hair artist in this yeah. uh, well, group will understand. Oh my God! No, I think someone who's been there will understand doing this there. <laughs> it's the midges. Do you remember the midges? Oh, the midges? That's the way great. Oh. Rings over our heads, didn't we? We still got bitten. The, they're yeah. like flying piranhas. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm. So I'm sorry, because we were told, they, oh, they look like mosquitoes, you know, this simple small thing. I said, I come from India, you know, I've seen, I know mosquitoes. <laughs> These things were new. <laughs> they were, oh my God. Tell I was, like. yeah, I remember the scene with Judy and me, you know, sitting in the, in the boat, and we, the, the, we couldn't finish that scene, mm. because suddenly Judy's about to take her line, and she goes, you know, <laughs> and I go, and then I'm going, no, Judy, wait. <laughs> oh. so, <laughs> we had to wrap it, you know. I, I hope some of those bites got covered up in okay. some... <laughs> well, it was a wonderful picture. Uh, I do want to say, uh, I think makeup and hair for a period movie is underestimated. I completely agree. Um, I hear so many comments, and this isn't a gripe, it's just really an observation. Um, actually, somebody said it to us at the hotel when we were here for the nominee's lunch. They said, oh, the Victor and Abdul, there wasn't much hair and makeup in that. Why are you up for... And we looked yeah. at each other, didn't we? Yeah. But people don't appreciate, they don't know how much goes into something like this. Absolutely. And the beauty of it is that you can't see it. And that's if, if you can't see it, then we've done our job well. I yes, think. I agree. <laughs> Ella, we're going to watch your 10-minute uh, reel. You. And you can sit right here. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I wanted to speak to you about the carpets we sent to the British Exhibition. There is a problem, sir? No, no, the carpets went down very well. In fact, the Governor-General has received a letter from the Royal Household thanking him personally. It's all been such a success, he has uh, decided to present the Queen with a mohur as part of the Jubilee. A mohur, sir? A mohur. Apparently some sort of ceremonial coin. I've been asked to find someone tall to present it. You're the tallest person here. When will she be arriving, sir? Not in Agra. In England. You will travel to England and present the mohur at an official function. Like an equerry. On a horse? Oh, I, I didn't think there'll be a horse. <laughs> equerry always has a horse, Mr. Tyler, sir. Well, maybe not like an equerry exactly. <laughs>
11 o'clock, meeting with the Swedish ambassador. 12 o'clock, luncheon with Oscar II, King of Sweden and Norway, the Norwegian ambassador, the chief undersecretary of state for the southern Norwegian provinces, the junior undersecretary of state for the northern Norwegian provinces. Two o'clock, ceremonial drive down the Mall. half past two, tea party at Hyde Park for 30,000 children. She's here. Soup. There's another famine in India. More trouble in Ireland, I'm afraid. Sewers is a perennial nightmare, and I'm afraid the Boers are at it again. Is there any good news, Prime Minister? Uh, well, we've decided to annex Zululand, Your Majesty. Whatever for? We really have to box in the Boers if we possibly oh, Prime can. Prime Minister, you really are much, terribly depressing. Yes. Sir Henry, I would like a mango. A mango? Yes, I would like to taste a mango. <laughs> it's impossible, Your Majesty. Uh, they only grow in India. Well, I'm Empress of India, so I have one cent. You must be the Hindus. Very nice to meet you. You must be the Hindus. You must be the Hindus. More, 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 more. I wish she'd bloody well go to bed. Mandi perani ko nas hai. Yes, yes. <laughs> Shukriya, Abdul. Tum behtreen munshi ho. Thank you, Abdul. You are an excellent teacher. Bertie. Mother. Are you spying on me? Were you learning Urdu? Yes, I was, as a matter of fact. You think that's entirely appropriate? Well, I'm Empress of India. What could be more appropriate? But in front of the entire household. You're absolutely right. I have no privacy here. Sir Henry, I would like to go with Abdul to Glassel Shield. Glassel Shield? Alone. But I've only just got here. I'm called Little Bunny. 
buttercup, dear little buttercup, though I could never tell why. But still I'm called buttercup, poor little buttercup, sweet little buttercup I. A scene in ancient Persia. I am the Sultan of Persia, the king of all kings. Based on the New York Times bestseller, Wonder tells the inspiring and heartwarming story of August Pullman, a boy with facial differences who enters fifth grade, attending an elementary school for the first time. Please welcome Academy Award nominee, special makeup designer for the film Wonder, Arian Dyden. This is Arian's first nomination, although he does, has been nominated for a BAFTA. Hello there. Hi, how are you? I think you brought a guest with you. Yes, I sure did. I have our director, Stephen Schabowski, here. Yay! Hello, lovely to meet you. Right. Oh, you look good. Thank you. <laughs> it was the makeup. <laughs> did you whip over there and do his makeup this morning? <laughs> <laughs> right. So Wonder has been uh, a potential film project for some time. Um, one of the biggest obstacles, is my understanding, from the film being green lit, was made uh, was because of Augie Pullman's look and recreating the Treacher Collins syndrome. So I know you wanted a real boy, Stephen, to in, in makeup for your film. Could you both share with us how this journey to the makeup we now know came about? Should I go first? Um, well, I was approached when I was, uh, well, uh, I was still working for Rick Baker in 2014, uh, before Stephen was um, involved. And um, I might have been approached for it, but uh, it was a different director back then. And um, they were basically thinking, well, you know, we're not sure if we're gonna do this. We don't have the budget for full CG or visual effects, so we're not sure yet. And uh, it went away uh, in 2015, they came back, I couldn't do it. Uh, and then a year later they came back again. And um, that's when Steven was on board and I met Steven. And um, I th in that time I always felt, okay, I, this may could be done on this, on this boy, but of course it's a very difficult task to figure out how. Um, 
put him on a shooting and stuff, but I had a gut feeling it could be done. We just needed to find it, and then I met Steven. <laughs> That's funny, because I thought it was a lot more than a gut feeling. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> but it's got the job now, you see. <laughs> I, I just, you, you inspire a lot more confidence than that in the room, so congratulations <laughs> to that. To, uh, in the world of the fake it till you make it, bravo, Arian. Um, because literally, you're the reason why I did the movie, because I thought, I, I love the story so much, it was such a beautiful story, and the only, the only obstacle for me was, could it look real, and could it be done practically? Um, because I knew that CG would just feel like a computer. Yeah. Real makeup would feel like a real childhood and feel like a real boy. And it was the whole, and we saw some early tests that, you know, I was, a, a, you know, a couple directors in. Um, the, the film had fallen apart many times, and I finally, I, I got very lucky, and it came to me. And, and I still didn't know if it could be done. And then we had that meeting in Todd Lieberman's office, and, uh, you know, uh, and after I met him, I thought, okay, this man's a genius. He understands this thing in a way that I, I when you had already started pitching your ideas about the eye, I don't want to, you know, uh, bury the lead as it were, but, um, and that was it. It was, I knew it had to be a real child, and I knew that the only person that I had met who could pull that off was this man. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. So there we are. That leads to: Would you share with us how you approach creating this makeup, and what did the makeup consist of? Because many people don't realise that it's a combination of prosthetics and mechanisms. Right. Um, the makeup was designed on Jacob Tremblay, who plays Augie Pullman, and he was nine years old when we started production. And I met him. Uh, there you see the sculpture on the life cast and, the, and next to his regular cast. So basically, he has a, a neck prosthetic from his chest going all the way by, past his shoulders up to his chin, cheeks, and then he has a, a front face and a nose. Um, basically, he's completely covered, and then he has a mechanical, uh, like, um, carbon fiber skull cap underneath the wig and the prosthetics that would have a wire a th a thread system to pull the eyes down. Well, that was what I was wanted to ask you. How did the carbon fiber under the skull mechanism work? Um, it was, um, it took some time to figure out because he was also growing during production. But, uh, <laughs> and then there's that. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> but it, it took some time to figure it out because I knew I couldn't glue his eyes down. The reason why his eyes appear droopy is because the condition he has is treat your Collins syndrome. And uh, I knew I couldn't glue him down for nine hours. He'd be very uncomfortable. So I said, well, it has to be a, re there has to be a way to release it and, and, and lock it. And um, uh, it was basically a fishing wire that was attached to an eye bag that ran through a tubing into a locking system that was hidden in the wig. Yeah. And I have to say, practically, remember some of the early tests that we did, the camera test, you could, you could click it. There, there were up to three settings. And so sometimes, you know, to get the asymmetry, uh, you had the great idea of like, well, I could do two clicks with one eye and one click with the other eye, and it's going to give you uh, an asymmetrical face without, you know, uh, with the with the real mechanism, which I thought was brilliant. That is brilliant, absolutely brilliant. I think that the next still that we have actually sort of shows you more. Isn't it? There we go. Yeah, you can see the, the helmet going on. That's Michael Nikiforik, who was here, by the way. He's from Vancouver, and uh, he helped me apply this makeup. He was wow. amazing. Um, I want to point out, like, it's interesting to, because, you know, when you pull somebody's eyes down, it, yes. it looks like that. So he also wears contact lenses, actually, um, to enlarge the iris, and that kind of filled up the bottom of the eye white. Remember how much difference that made without yes. the lens and with the lens? Um, yeah, sometimes it was amazing how we, we would we would approach it, and by we, I mean him. We'd approach it uh, It was the royal we. Yes, that, that yes, was the, the other royal thing. we. Um, <laughs> Where it's, you know, one of the parts of the condition, uh, this certain uh, thing with the eyes where there, there's, less, um, there's less of the white. And so we thought, uh, and he thought, uh, can you get the bigger, you know, the bigger iris? And, and it's amazing how sometimes adding too much of one thing led to the illusion of too little of another thing. Right. And so it was a, a really great um, uh, practical way to do everything. I thought it was just fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so now I've got a question for both of you. So obviously Jacob was a minor, and who was nine at the time. Now in such a big makeup every day, how did your approach change to make it work? 
There must have been many challenges, and, and is there a story that you'd care to share with us today? You go first. Well, the answer is Benadryl. <laughs> <laughs> no, it wasn't. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I really don't have a story for it. I will say this, because to me, the, the amazing artistry that went on in the makeup trailer was a mystery to me. All I know is Jacob Tremblay would go into the makeup trailer as Jacob Tremblay. He'd come out as Augie. And not only in terms of, obviously, his physical transformation, but there's something about the process. And you, I'm sure you'll have many stories about what went on in the trailer itself. I only went in there a couple of times. Um, but, but it was remarkable to watch him completely change because of the makeup. Jacob, is a, he's a rambunctious kid. He's a, really, he's, he's a little bit of a hellion sometimes in a great way. He's just such a good kid, but he's such a cut up. And then, but Augie's not. And there's something about sitting in that chair that I almost feel like, you know, Jacob is a, he's a kind of a once in a generation talent. And I think he used the patience that he had to have in that chair, almost like the patience that Augie would have had to have had through all the surgeries. There's something about being still that, that led him to this character. And then he'd go back, at the end of the day, he'd go back in to get the makeup off and he'd come out of the trail and he's Jacob again. It was a remarkable thing to see. Yeah, yeah. Um. Yeah, I mean, amazing. I mean, for us, of course, it was so much, you know, we hadn't leaned, had nothing to lean on. So it's, I, when I first met him, I kind of needed to get his energy a little bit, see what he was like. I mean, uh, he was able to do, I mean, he has teeth in, he has the helmet, the wigs, the lenses, the full, I mean, it's a lot for any actor, let alone him being nine. Um, and, but you're right. I mean, as soon as the prosthetics went on, he would kind of hunch and he would become Augie and he would become, you know, a different kid. And, uh, um, but you know, at the same time, what a, what a trooper! I mean, we got it done in an hour and fifteen minutes, everything. And uh, yeah. Okay. yeah, so you could shoot more. Yeah, not on the first day. Not on the first day, <laughs> however. <laughs> you had to bring it up. <laughs> Um, but how great is Jacob? I mean, <laughs> you know. See, what, how are you telling time back there with the sundial? You're like, yeah, it's about hour 15. I'm sitting there like, hello, are please, I'm dying. you inviting him now. <laughs> yeah, that's right. But, I, I mean, I have to give kudos to, to Jacob as well. I mean, I don't think any other kid could have gone through that in that age. And he would, every morning he would come in and the first thing he'd say, Jacob in makeup. You know, and it, it was just, it was just, yeah, you know, he was great. How amazing. And were his parents supportive? Were his, did his parents stay with him in the trailer? Yeah, his parents were amazing, very down to earth. I mean, uh, and they were a huge help. And I, you know, and I knew going, look, you test makeups at my shop and, and, and doing all this stuff. But I warned him, like, it's fun now, one time, two times. But by day 20, and you still, you're halfway, he's gonna, he's gonna have a bit of a moment. And he did. And, and I said, please be there if he does. And he, they were, and they were amazing. Yeah. And, and how many test makeups? How many chances did you have a go at testing? Um, I think we did two different makeup tests, and then we really needed a third one, but we didn't. Yeah, and yeah we had one in L.A. and one in Vancouver, oh, right? No, we had two at my. Oh, two, in two in yours? And okay. We, yeah, we kind of refurbished some stuff in Vancouver. But, uh, yeah, it was about two months, two and a half months, I'd say. Yeah, but, you know, it, it's a bummer that you didn't get your third, but at the same time, like, you know, one less test means one less set of notes, you know what I mean? For That's right. For, for, and, and not, you know, the one thing that was, because I thought my job as a director was more kind of keeping everybody at bay because I knew that you you had a vision for it and, and you were going to pull it off and make it great. And whatever things could, people could say about, can he be a little more of this, a little bit more of that? Because, you know, people love this book and everyone has an idea about what Augie looks like and a reader's perception of a character is very, very powerful. So it wasn't a bunch of studios like mucking it up. It wasn't that. It was more of just very passionate readers who wanted kind of their thought in there. So it was his job, with my help, to just take the best ideas, leave the bad ones behind, and just move forward. Would you, would you say? Oh, yeah, I would say so. I mean, uh, it's just trying to find that right balance between, and also with, all, with that much prosthetics and stuff going on, a, a Jacob still being able to act through it and tell the story, and that was very important. So you just have to eventually find that balance. Well, I think it's a wonderful film. I mean, it really is, and Thank wonderful you. work. Thank you. I really do. So we're going to watch 10 Minute Reel that was at, at the Bake Off now. And um, thank you so much, thank Stephen, thank for you. coming. It's wonderful.
I know I'll never just be an ordinary kid. Ordinary kids don't make other kids run away from playgrounds. Ordinary kids don't get stared at wherever they go. But it's okay if you want to stare too. My name is Augie Pullman. Next week, I start fifth grade. And since I've never been to real school before, I'm pretty much totally and completely petrified. Take that off, please. It'll be okay. Why do I have to be so ugly? You are not ugly, Augie. You just have to say that because you're my mom. Oh, because I'm your mom, it doesn't count? <laughs> yeah. Because I'm your mom, it counts the most because I know you the most. You are not ugly and anyone who cares to know you will see that. They won't even talk to me. It matters that I look different. I try to pretend that it doesn't, but it does. I know. <laughs> Is it always gonna matter? I don't know. Well, honey, listen. Look at me. We all have marks on our face. I have this wrinkle here from your first surgery, and I have these wrinkles here from your last surgery. This is the map that shows us where we're going. And this is the map that shows us where you've been. And it's never, ever ugly. What about your gray hair? That's compliments of your dad, I think. Come on, get ready. It's almost time for the Halloween parade. You're supposed to knock. Go away! Mom says you won't say what happened. Someone say something? Someone always says something! Well, tell me what happened. It's none of your business! You took my day with Mom, so it is my business. I heard Jack Wolf talking about me behind my back. He said he'd kill himself if he looked like me. Jack Will? Isn't he the nice one? There are no nice ones! I wish I'd never gone to school in the first place! But you were liking school. I know you are. I hate it, okay? I hate it! Augie, I'm sorry, but you're not the only one who has bad days. Bad days? Do people avoid touching you? When a person accidentally touches you, do they call it the plague? No. Jack Wool is all I had. Just don't compare your bad days at school to mine, okay? Okay. Hey, did you notice that Miranda doesn't come around anymore? What? You didn't. Shocker. Yeah, she went away to camp this summer and now she doesn't like me anymore. Why? Because school sucks and people change. So if you wanna be a normal kid, Augie, then those are the rules. I thought you were at the library. Uh, um, yeah, change your plans. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Justin. Isabel. Daisy threw up again. Bucket load. <laughs> Bucket loads. 
Um, Justin, this is my little brother, Augie. Hey, dude. Hey. What's that in your case? A machine gun? <laughs> uh, no. It's a fiddle. I should tell people it's a machine gun. That's way cooler. You know what? That's a great idea. You're right. We're on our way to the grocery. Mom's making, what's it called? Fijuata. Fij Mom's making fijuata. It's Dad's favorite. You're welcome to stay if you want, Justin. Oh, thank you very much. It was nice meeting you. Nice to meet you, too. Oops. Oi. Bye, Augie. Nothing to see here. going to see the play? Um, I hadn't realized what the play was, and I don't think it will be of any interest to a kid your age. Yeah, uh, you, you get totally bored. Are you and Dad going? Daddy will go, and I'm going to stay here with you. What? So now you're going to punish me by not going? Well, you didn't want me to go in the first place, remember? Well, now that you know about it, of course I want you to come. What are you talking about? Nothing. Nothing. You're lying. It's just something to do with via school, honey. You just don't want your fancy high school friends to know your brother's a freak, huh? Augie. Augie, that's not true. Stop lying to me. I'm not an idiot. I know what's going on. Did DC really bite Mom? Well, um, she was whimpering. And then Mom tried to pick her up, and Daisy bit her. Do you think the vet can fix her? She was in a lot of pain, Augie. She's really old. Augie, I want you to come to my play, OK? Really? Really. What do we got here? A couple of losers thinking up the woods. Holy crap, look at his face. He's a freak. Jesus, I've never seen anything that ugly in my life. <laughs> Maybe it's an orc. Dude, let's go. Go where? Hey, talking to you, Gollum. Is this the one mass to rule them all? My precious. <laughs> hey, what's your problem? <laughs> your boyfriend's my problem. Hey, leave him alone. What are you going to do about it? Get out of my way. No. I said, get out of my way! I said, no! Yo, Jack, what's up, man? Are you okay? Oh, uh, dude, you're bleeding. What was that? Something's going. Avis? Yeah. Over here! Avis, come on! Can I follow you? I think we lost him. No. <laughs> How did you guys know we needed help? We saw them follow you out of the lodge. I think they were seventh graders. They were huge. <laughs> thanks, guys. You totally saved our butts. Yeah, thanks, guys. You know, it was cool how you stood your ground, little dude. <laughs>
Well, we're now going to open to questions from the floor. Please welcome all our Oscar nominees back to the stage. But as we begin this section, um, there are going to be helpers. Can you identify yourselves in the aisles, please, for everyone? Just wave around there. And they have microphones, so if you want to ask a question, just put your hand in the air and hopefully they'll spot you. Um, but please, you know, refrain from asking multiple questions because there's an awful lot of people and I'm sure that you're all bursting to ask questions. So one each, please, and then if there's time, you can ask a second one. And please keep it to the films we've seen today and the artists up here, you know, careers. Thank you. Come on up, gang. Hello, no fighting. <laughs> right, so... Um, oh, you again. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so before we, we actually um, ask a question of the audience, I'm going to be um, very cheeky and ask a question of the nominees that I would actually like to know. And I hope many of you will join in with wanting to know that too. So, we're going to keep it brief because obviously it's not my time, it's their time. But... How did you begin on the path of being a makeup artist and or hairstylist? Um, I started as a hairstylist, knew I didn't want to work in a salon for the rest of my life. Um, then I trained as a graphic artist, which was a technical, technical drawing, basically. And I designed interiors of luxury yachts. Um, my mother was an interior designer and she had a client who was a makeup artist. And Sadly, my motivation was a picture of her on a, an exotic location eating a, a beautiful breakfast. And I thought, I could do that job. That looks like the kind of job I did. Because it was creative and drawing and hairdressing. And, that was, and then when I trained at school, when I was at school, I was never taught about how to get into the film industry. It wasn't a career choice. So it was really just from a photograph, I'm ashamed to say. But that was my motivation. That's great. Lou? And me, I started in a hairdressing salon. I did my apprenticeship. But again, like Daniel, I knew that wasn't the path I wanted. And uh, I just happened to see an advert for a job in a wig company with creations. And I applied and got it. And from there, I went and worked um, at other wig companies. And I worked at the BBC. And I did that sort of for, what, 25 years or whatever it was. I did some teaching. I used to teach at London College of Fashion. And um, then I sort of fell into it, really, because somebody said, you fancy coming out? And I never went back, really. That was it. And I just loved it. So I went on from job to job, met Daniel once again. Um, yeah, so that's how it was, really. And here I am still doing it. 20 years later, I'm <laughs> 35, wherever it was. Yeah. Um, I was nine when I knew when I wanted to do makeup. Nine. And yeah, God, that's I, remember, I remember making wounds on my sisters with bread yeah. dough. Yeah. <laughs> And, um, <laughs> true, true story. Um, uh, I finished high school when I was 16. Um, I went to makeup school in Amsterdam five days a week. And uh, pretty much within a year I started working, little local TV shows and, and, um, and little movies. And uh, when I was 19 I, I got in contact, actually I was 18 when I got in contact with Dick Smith and um, studied with him correspondence. And I eventually came out to LA when I was 19. Um, worked for Stan Winston, who sponsored me, and for my immigration papers, and, um, and later Rick Baker, and, uh, and now I'm here. So, yes. Uh, well, when I was in high school, I hated school, and I was figuring out what to do after <laughs> going out from school, and I found one magazine called Fangoria, and I found one article about Dick Smith. And so I decided, okay, this is the one I have to do. And I started to do makeup on myself. And the first one was uh, Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I did like uh, maybe four Lincoln on myself. But uh, so after maybe six months, I wrote, I found uh, his uh, PO box address on the back of the magazine. And I wrote to him, uh, Dick Smith, and he wrote me back almost like uh, I, I received a reply in 10 days. And since 
that you know, at that time, and he he wrote me back, and he said, okay, there's no good school out there. So whenever I come up with a new makeup, he you can send me a picture, so he he can give me a comment. And we started the correspondence, and he actually gave me a first opportunity to start uh, work right after I graduated high school. And I started professionally since 18, and on uh, 1996, when I was 26, uh, I was sponsored by Rick Baker to move out here, and that was the start of my career. Yeah. Hi. Um, uh, well, funnily enough, Daniel said he was going to work for, or did work for a um, luxury boat company, because that's what I was going to do. Um, I was going to. Um, you know, build the inside of these luxury boats. It was a big company back in the UK. And um, just before that job started, we were driving past a college and they were advertising this makeup course. And I said to my dad, that's, you know, that's what I'd always wanted to do. I'd always been messing around with latex at home and bread dough and all that kind of stuff. So we just went into the college, into their open evening. And um, that's it. I left, you know, I left there having signed up and went to college and sort of started from there, really. That was back in... 95, 96, I guess I went to college. But my background mainly, I, I went to college for a couple of years and then I moved to London in 98 and my background is Madame Tussauds. So I worked at Madame Tussauds for quite a few years um, making the wax figures. Um, so that's where I get my love for um, a makeup like Darkest Hour because it's just recreating um, skin um, textures, you know, skin colorings and that kind of stuff so just that real high detail work is sort of what I did so and then a few years after that I left and started working in the film industry and sitting here now which is insane in front of all these people <laughs> so yeah that's that's me um, I actually started in the art department I did a week's work experience on a tv show that I really enjoyed at the time and then they asked me to stay on which I did through university I did a fine art degree and then I realised it wasn't really the right department for me if I did loads of different jobs, runner, set dresser, buyer and then I thought well, this isn't really my department but I knew that I wanted to, I love painting so I thought well, maybe I'd be better at painting faces so I tried to get bits of work experience within the makeup department um, and then I did that for like a year while I was at university and then I came over here and trained for three months in LA and then went back and then just did be um, little jobs at the weekend after, so I'd work all week, go do better jobs at the weekend, get some pictures, and then that would get me better jobs. Um, and then I've eventually ended up here. So, yeah, that's how I got into it. That's great. Thank you. Right, questions in the audience? Put your hand up. I can see someone in the... Oh, I can see several people in the middle. Oh. I have a question over here. Lots of takers. Hi, uh, this is to the Darker Sour team and Wonder. Um, you said Gary Oldman, if you asked him to do something, he did it. Besides that, is there anything actors can do to prepare themselves for long sittings? Can they do anything to prepare themselves for long sittings? Yeah, I think if they listen to everything Gary Oldman said in his interviews um, and listen to it, they will, um, they'll be better actors in the makeup chair. <laughs> and if they listen to any of the interviews that ourselves have done already, because um, um, we were at an award ceremony the other night and um, the guy giving Gary Oldman his award, Malcolm, um, he said basically, you know, an actor, it's, it's who can sit, sit still the longest. It's like a competition. And obviously Gary wins that competition because he's sitting in the makeup chair for that amount of time completely still. So I think if all actors just sit there and do what we say when we say it, I think everybody will create better work, really, I guess, won't they? Um, I don't know. I don't know if that answers the question, but... Um, yeah. Um, God, yeah, I mean, with Jacob, it always it's very different because he's, he's a kid. So, uh, I mean, he just wouldn't sit any longer than an hour and a half either. He would just get very fidgety and stuff. So, um, but we found that he watched a movie for t typically either an hour and a half. So, he would watch and he'd sit really still. He was actually really great. Um, uh, we'd have 
you know, we mess around with him, like have a pillow fight or something afterwards, but just to kind of keep him, you know. Uh, but um, <coughs> it's 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 a, you know, he has to prepare for it in his head. But he did great, yeah. Excellent, gentle. Another person in the middle. There's several up the back. Someone mentioned laying in a facial hair. I wonder if you could explain a little bit that process, please. Um, yes, well, normally one would have, I, I used to have all of my hair pre-knotted onto hair lace. I think it's called gauze over here, fine gauze. But the problem is that doesn't last very long, as most of my colleagues will know. On It probably lasts a couple of days if you've got a piece of facial hair on, on a knotted gauze. Um, so the laying on is basically the old. Is the Italians use this method an awful lot. Um, it's the hackling of hair. It's the mixing of different hair color, and then um, it's basically we apply it with prosaic adhesive. You just load it onto the skin, and then you just start combing it out, and combing it out, and thinning the beards out, and then um, we then dress it with Marcel tongs, which are these tiny small tongs that go in a heater. Um, and it seems to last a lot longer um, it, because the prosthesis is, is flexible. It means that the face can move and then you're not forever bugging your actor sticking on wig lace, basically, hair lace. Is that explained to you? Yeah. Thank you. And also, it's a less, it can seem quite time consuming, but actually, once you get into the speed of it, you can actually become quite proficient and do it quite quickly. I was, uh, well, sh uh, I was really fascinated by the makeup in Wonder. It seemed incredibly durable for what you were explaining. I was wondering what you used to um, keep those uh, extensions that kept his eyes drooped in place, if, if they ever just popped off when he viciously hugged his mom. <laughs> yeah, actually, that, it, it was quite some, I'm glad you asked about that because it's, Art Sakamoto, actually, who was here as well, he helped me build the helmet. Um, the material, because of the tension of it, obviously it would pop off. And I actually had built the helmet for myself first before I ever met Jacob, just to see if the technique would work. And um, um, originally, the idea was that we had vinyl uh, cast um, uh, eye bags with a fishing wire stitched into a piece of fabric that was cast into the little eye bag. And mind you, it's like this big. And um, it worked on me, but it didn't work on Jacob because we just constantly pop loose. So um, we found that backing it with a little silicone, um, uh, I forgot the name now, and then um, we couldn't use any releases because it would, somehow residue would stick with it as well. So we used PVA and then uh, laid a fabric in there at the stitched wire and then cast the vinyl on top of it, let it set up, and then I would feed the wire to the tubing uh, and stitch it. So it was just every night I had to redo that, every night. And it's like, oh, midnight, yeah, stitching and things. But it made the makeup better, so I chose to do it. Yeah. Wow. Hello. I'm back here. <laughs> Uh, this is for the team for Darkest Hour. Uh, what research did you take into uh, coming up with the final look for Gary as Winston Churchill? Well, uh, what research? Uh, well, the, when I took a live cast of Gary and a bunch of pictures, and also we did a body scan, 3D scan, and what I did was just gathering up the photograph as much as possible, and it bought the lots of books and DVDs. And from DVDs, I did the uh, DVD captures and also uh, watched uh, his biography to understand who he was. And try to kind of when I create a character, I always try to try to understand who they were. It's just not just uh, what they look like. So uh, I can put the essence of Charcho on in the makeup. So just just a lot of researches and trying out. The hard part was just I cannot just put the face future on Gary and make it look right because it's it will look like him wearing a mask. So uh, try to figure out the good balance and uh, still. Gary to move through the makeup, so it won't be something really heavy. Yeah. 
think there are some people down the front. Stop. Hi. Um, I was. I. Eh. I have a question for um, Arjan, representing Wonder. Um, I understand you also worked um, with uh, Del Toro on Pan's Labyrinth, and I wanted to know how closely were, were you in conceptualizing those monsters, and how did that prepare you for your work on Wonder? Uh, oh, that's a bit, uh, let me think about that one. Um, it's so completely different. Um, obviously, I, I, well, I did that for DDT, and as a bar shop in Barcelona, I was 24 at the time. And um, um, I, uh, I constructed the Pill Man, basically. But um, I, Augie is such a different character because obviously he's based on a real condition. Um, um, I, I'm not sure how, how connected that is other than me doing a lot of research with hospitals and talking to families who had kids with treacher Collins syndrome, um, making sure that, that that's right. Um, so, yeah, I'm not sure how to answer that question fully. I hope I'm not disappointing you. <laughs> uh, hi, I just would have an additional question about wonder in terms of medical or legal considerations, do you have anything that you have to consider in terms of the makeup for a child? Or is it all just the logistical things that you've already explained? Um, I think other than uh, him being extremely tight on the clock, um, as Stephen will, will remember. <laughs> yeah, I saw you stress out quite a few times. And uh, no, but that's, that's, I mean, other than that, uh, um, uh, yeah, just trying to get him in makeup in time, and uh, so Steve could shoot as much as he could. Uh, I believe we had nine hours from door to door in Vancouver. That was an hour extra than they have in the United States, for example. If I'm not if I'm not wrong, uh, so that extra hour for production was very essential. Um, um, and um, and I remember uh, meeting some of the kids coming through with their families uh, on set. But uh, yeah. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Trevor Proud. It's not so, not so much as a question as a statement. First of all, I'd like to offer my congratulations to all the nominees. Your work is absolutely incredible. Thank you. Thank you, Trevor. Uh, but my statement is directed at one nominee in particular, Lou Shepard. I've known her for 20 years. Her work is incredible, as she is. And I'm very happy to finally see her receive the recognition that she so richly deserves. Oh. Oh, no. Did you pay for that? <laughs> yeah. I gave you a fiver. Yeah, I gave you a fiver. Oh, no. oh, it was lovely. Thank you um, very much. Yes, well, certainly. I've known right. Lou for so many years. We we actually frightened each other in the in the reception beforehand. Any other questions? In uh, darkest hour, did the smoke affect the makeup? The cigar um, smoke. Oh, the cigar smoke. Um, Made it look a bit softer, maybe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Put smoke in the scene. Yeah, they did a little bit. Yeah, they had a little Just bit. But, a bit I mean, of but Gary was. Smoking. I don't. I can't remember the facts of how many cigars he went through, but um, he went through a lot. And obviously, the continuity of the cigar. So you know, you'd start a cigar, and then you'd have to start another one up because the other one's got the first one's gone too short. So you then yeah. crack into another one. And I think they're fifty pound each, weren't they? Yeah. And he got through wow. thousands. I mean, he like loads. I mean, it's all the time. <laughs> Gary Greenham did say that he thought he should get an award for the cigar continuity. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, um, my name is Michael. Uh, so when you guys first heard about the movie you were gonna do, like not even the test or anything, you just heard what movie you guys were working on, what was the biggest concern slash worry you had going into it? And that's for all the panel, correct? Yeah. That's for all of everyone. Um, I think it's always the time factor for us, really. I think probably for most of us, you have very limited time to to, you have to scale down what one would like to do for a makeup. You know, we'd all love to do these great big makeups, but it's it's really about time. Um, 
for hair and makeup, we probably get an hour, hour and 15 tops. Um, and you've kind of got to complete everything. And it's all, it costs thousands and thousands of dollars or pounds. So I think for me, it's the time issue, really. That's what it, my main consideration is. Right. Mm, I agree. Yeah. And also, people always imagine. Oh, people always imagine that you have a long time with the with the main artist. But in fact, they need to get them out of the chair even quicker, don't they? So you don't have a lot of time at all. Um, for me, it was um, well. Again, it, it, believing that this should be done as a makeup, and uh, I, I didn't want it to fall back into other uh, uh, um, departments. So I. I I felt this could be done, but it just, you know, it was a way of re a lot of research, but. Yeah, in my case, it just, uh, always I go into the mode that try to imagine how it would turn out to be in my head and go through that for m almost a few days and try to figure out what to do. Because sometimes, you know, like a makeup job, like a likeness makeup is so hard, uh, almost impossible. So. Uh, I go into the imagination like a days to figure out in my head and give them an answer if I really can do it or not. Yeah. Uh, mine, mine was because, um, I don't know if you know, but I worked with Gary on a film just before Darkest Hour called Hitman's Bodyguard and then it was a few weeks after that he sent me a text message saying, um, hi it's Gary, how do you fancy doing Churchill? And which, you know, I've never had a message like that before, and I guess... Um, so my, I, th I think my biggest worry was the fact that Gary had recommended me to Kazu, and he had recommended me to Joe, the director, and the producers and stuff. So, and they were like, who's this guy from the UK? Like, you know, why do you want him to do it? And he said, that's the guy I want. Um, so then I just felt immense pressure because he's stuck his neck out for me. You know, he's... Um, if I was going to let anybody down, it would be letting Gary down ultimately, and then he would, you know, let Joe down and the producers. So I think that was my biggest, um, my biggest worry was not to let Gary down. <laughs> um, so yeah. Um, my biggest worry was probably whether we were going to do a good enough job for Kazu, and because nobody really knew who yeah. we were, and Kazu is so brilliant, and whether we were going to do a good enough job of the makeup, and then when. I got given the job of the wig, whether I would do a good enough job for Diana, and but hopefully we did all right. Yeah, because I, th I think s someone said to me when I was considering the job, because I didn't accept straight away, I had to think about it and spoke to Gary, and they said, um, you know, it's a Kazoo makeup. You, you don't want to be the guy to mess up a Kazoo makeup. <laughs> so this could be this, well, this could make you or break you this job. And I was like, oh, thanks. Um, that was Mark, my, my boss at the time. But he said, but good luck, you know, whatever you decide. I'm like, cheers. <laughs> so, yeah. They, but, they uh, did an amazing job. <laughs> Hi, I'm Dave. Uh, firstly, congratulations to each one of you for being nominated. Most of you are British, I think. So here's my question to David um, and also the team for, who worked on Wonder. Uh, the skin is sometimes really sensitive when you put prosthetics on. So in your case, uh, how difficult was it to keep that on? For how long did you have to keep it? Did you have to change it every single day? Or, and how did it work on the little kid as well? So is this for Darkest Hour or Wonder? For both. Uh, uh, you go first. Oh, thanks. <laughs> um, so what do we do? Uh, yeah, we, um, we prep Gary's skin by um, cleaning it uh, with uh, Kiehl's um, a product, which uh, takes away any oils and things from the skin. And then we used Dermashield as a barrier. And then um, we used um, a glue called Telesis 8. It changed just before we started on... Um, um, on the job, and um, Gary had sort of used PPI products before. He's used their glues and paints and stuff, so he's quite adamant that they wanted to use the same glue because um, because his his days were so long. He was in makeup for well, it took us sort of three and a half hours to put it on. Then he's in makeup for ten or twelve hours a day, and then we're taking it off. And because 
um, you know, there's not much time from when we take the makeup off to then sticking it back on again. The um, the routine of that every day we were a bit concerned about, but you know, we just worked out that using that particular glue with the removers and just doing it slowly, you know, Gary's skin was absolutely fine. We didn't have any problems with you know redness or um, he never got irri his skin wasn't irritated at any point, was it really? It was. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, we, I think if we'd had a problem with that, I don't know what they would have done because Gary's in every single, sh almost every single shot. So I think, um, I mean, they were concerned about it. The producers did come to me and say, what happens if Gary's skin breaks out and we have a problem? Um, and I said, I just, I can't answer that until it happens. But fortunately, every single day it was fine, you know. Um, I mean, that's, that asks quite a lot of someone's skin, you know, because all the coverage... Um, you know, silicon's not breathable, so everything's happening under that all day. But we were just fortunate that the products were used and Gary's skin um, and the way we took it off. So I'm always quite adamant that if I can, to take the makeup off myself if I apply it. Because especially if you're applying it the, the following day, if you just hand it over to somebody else and they're kind of ripping it off their face and they're jabbing them with brushes or using the wrong products or the wrong mix of products you then get in the next day and you apply the glue onto Gary's face and he would he'd be really sore and it would sting and then, you know, yeah, it's just not ideal, so. But, yeah, we were fortunate it kind of worked out. Bit of a long answer, that, but. Um, with Jacob, um, since he's this young, um, uh, his skin was actually quite holding up really well because it's, you know, I, I remember using uh, Telesis 5 for most of his uh, facial pieces. Um, we actually didn't glue the neck. Um, it was designed in such a way that it was very <coughs> snug, so we shaved down the core, so when the neck went on, um, the snugness of it itself uh, would stay on. So there was no glue on any of this part. Um, and that also helped buckling because how quickly silicone necks buckle and look fake. Um, so that eliminated that problem. Again, it was also designed just to cut makeup time. And then uh, I believe we used Telesis 8 underneath the eyes. Um, Jacob got a little sensitive to the smells of all that and he liked the Telesis 8. To him it smelled like oranges. <laughs> And uh, he, well, he also believed his prosthetics were made out of cartilage. So, you know, it's, <laughs> yeah. Do I have cartilage on my face? I'm like, yes. Uh, yeah, so, and he would go around the set, I have cartilage on my face. I'm like, yes, you do. <laughs> no, but, and then at the end of the day, we would clean it with, I think, believe, isopropyl mirror state and, um, and some uh, steaming towels and, just, you know, various products. Well, it, it looks like, I mean, the time has just flown. I don't know about, about you, but it just seems to have whisked by. Unfortunately, we don't have time for any more questions. But, um, <clears throat> excuse me, I'd just like to thank everyone for coming today and making this a memorable event. Great thanks to our special guests and, of course, all of you, the audience, for attending today. Well, before everyone dashes off, hang on, I've got to remind you, you have to watch, watch the Oscars on telly tomorrow, please. It's the 90th, it'll be great, and you can see everyone here and, and cheer them on. Um, and there can only be one winner, but uh, these are all our winners so far. So please join us in the lobby and applaud them now. Yeah.